Hi, Brandon here with FastDataScience.ai, and welcome to This Week in AI, the show where I bring you some of the latest, most interesting headlines in data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And today, welcome world, or at least all 71 of you who are in it. And now that I hear that, I'm realizing how strangely post-apocalyptic that may come across. But nevertheless, regardless is what I was actually going to say, I'm celebrating. I'm celebrating because I hit a milestone this last week, and that milestone is that we now have over 70 subscribers to this channel. And those 70 subscribers are 70 more people than I ever thought I would be in front of. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your subscription. And I really look forward to continuing to bring more and more value into your life by talking about the issues that matter around artificial intelligence and how they impact our lives every day. So in today's show, we're going to talk about video games, we're going to talk about autism, and Google is back in the news. Recall last week, Google was making a stir because one of their engineers said it created a sentient artificial intelligence. Well, they're back, and we're going to continue that conversation today with Google's new baseball. Oh, all right, let's go ahead and jump into the content. Today is June 24th, 2022, and what actually matters is not that I have my data science running on this program anymore. Nope. Our bot is in the shop undergoing some needed changes to improve the intelligence that I'm bringing to help identify even more interesting news articles. But two, my brain has been tuned with all of that data science I've lay layered in over the last many weeks that I've been doing that for this show. So I've identified some really awesome articles that I think are gonna be most interesting to how AI is impacting us in today's world. All right, so the first article is how machine learning AI is going to change gaming forever. See, when I first read this article, I'm not a big gamer, but I thought in my mind, like surely, you know, Microsoft is, embedding artificial intelligence into some of the games that it's producing, you know, that must be the case. Well, this article actually turns out to explain how that's largely not the case. In fact, most non-player characters or NPCs from games have been rule-based, if not all, actually. What does that mean? That means that pretty tricky programmers have figured out a series of rules that are contained in the context of a video game story that provide you, the video game player, with an experience with those NPCs that in some cases can feel mildly intelligent, almost like there is some kind of simplistic AI under the covers. And even the storylines sometimes feel dynamic, like they're adjusting to what we're doing. But all of that really is just a complex set of tricky programming rules. None of it is really based off of artificial intelligence, which means probabilistic models that probabilistically determine what might happen in a video game or what you might see or what you might experience. So this article actually starts to tackle what that future of video gaming could look like. Are large language models going to be made available to those non-player characters so that now they're generating responses that are actually not explicitly programmed into the video game? In other words, the programmers won't even know what those responses could be. They'll be dependent on how you, the player, actually interacts with them. Or even more interesting, what if the actual video game and its storyline could dynamically change by creating new characters? Consider this. Dolly, the famous language-to-image model that was produced by OpenAI. Well, what if there was a way to embed Dolly into a video game to create new characters that you could then interact with? For example, maybe you come up with an idea in talking to a non-player character in the context of a video game, and you ask about some strange monster that doesn't actually exist in the game. And maybe Dolly conjures up this monster. And now we have a new interaction in our video game, an entirely different video game, a dynamic video game. Whether or not that's actually feasible is still yet to be seen. Nevertheless, super cool. And this article actually starts to suggest that there are some models, some artificially intelligent models like Dolly or like GPT-3 or like Lambda, which Google is fairly well known for at this point. But these things may actually perform some of the basis for more dynamic gameplay going into the future. Really interesting. We'll have to see what happens next. 
but I'd like to learn more about some of those dynamic video games. All right, let's talk about the next article. Artificial neural networks model facial processing in autism. Okay, so let's hold on and unpack this article a little bit more detail because this sounds really interesting. So let's jump in and figure out what's going on here. So the article describes how autism is associated with poor emotion recognition. This is something that we've known for a very long time. It's one of the key defining features and how doctors actually help diagnose individuals, particularly young children, who may be autistic or on the spectrum. Researchers have identified two possible areas in the brain that may be responsible for this poor emotion recognition. One is an area uh, in the IT sort of temporal region of the brain. Oh, man, I'm really digging back into my old psychology sort of studies to remember parts of the brain. But this part of the temporal cortex is involved in facial processing. Another part of the brain that's responsible for processing emotion is the amygdala. And researchers really don't know, they're sort of out on which of these brain areas is more important in affecting an autistic person's ability to recognize emotions. Until now. So researchers in this article used artificial neural, neural networks to model both autistic and neurotypical pa uh, patients. What does that mean? So here's what it means from a data scientist perspective. They took patients who are autistic and what we call neurotypical. They had them perform a facial recognition task of faces that vary like this, all right? Where actually they're on a s spectrum of fear and happiness. And actually looking at this face, it might be kind of hard to tell whether or not she's scared or happy or somewhere in between. Nevertheless, what the researchers did was they had people perform these tasks. Then what they did was they trained an artificial neural network, or actually a series of different artificial neural networks, to identify how that artificial neural network would make a distinction between happy or fearful emotion in the images. The original model they built actually performed more consistent with what the neurotypical participants perform like. In order to then further study what might be happening in the neural model, the researchers started to affect the different layers of the neural network by changing them, either removing them or changing some of their parameters. What they found was where they saw the biggest impact on the network's performance that made the network start to perform more like an autistic individual than a neurotypical individual was whenever they started affecting the last layer of the network. If you understand how the brain works, the brain is organized from sort of primitive areas of the brain, lower level areas like the amygdala, that stack on top of each other to more neocortical regions of the brain, like our temporal region that's responsible for processing faces. What this suggests in this research is that those temporal facial processing regions may actually be more important for our ability to actually classify or recognize different emotions in people. And they have discovered this, or at least they've, they've get, gotten some evidence of this through these artificial neural networks. They then follow this up. I mean, this gets even cooler. They follow this up and they build additional neural networks to model the performance of one type of person over the other. So they build two separate networks. One performs like an autistic person, the other performs like a neurotypical person. Then they compare the weights of the models. And what they found was that the weights of the autistic model that was more representative of how an autistic person may perform in this facial recognition task or emotion recognition task, that those weights actually were weaker on average than the weights of the neurotypical model. So the neurotypical model had stronger activation and inhibition weights, positive and negative weights in the neural net uh, that they had built. This suggests that the overall network of autistic brains has more noise throughout. That is, neurons have trouble coordinating around whether or not making a decision on a face being happy or fearful. What I love about this article, I mean, it's super fascinating. What I love about this is it actually shows us how we can use our relationship with neural nets and the brain to inform our understanding of both. So this article provides us with a really creative application of artificial neural networks and how we layer them and, and can use them in these really creative and informative ways. All right, so let's get into what caught my eye for this week. So as I mentioned at the beginning, what caught my eye this week, Google does a big fat facepalm. 
Okay, so there's a fantastic article in The Atlantic that was published this last week that talks about the Lambda debacle. So if you recall from last week, Lambda actually uh, got in the news because some engineer at Google had a conversation with Lambda, this large language model, and that conversation resulted in a conclusion from that engineer, presumably a very smart person, although has some really quirky background, that actually that language model might be sentient, right? Because it was saying things like, I like to meditate, or yeah, you know, I'm worried about getting turned off. And you know, that seemed like novel, kind of self-aware conversation. And so this individual, this engineer said, hey, that might be sentient. Well, a bunch of people in the industry said, wait a second, no, that's just a lack of understanding. You're anthropomorphizing Lambda. It's, it's just a prediction model. It's a big probability engine. And all it's doing is just predicting the next word. And it does a pretty good job at predicting next words that are actually interesting because they train these models for, quote unquote, interestingness in the words that they're predicting. All right, fast forward to this article, and Google, uh, and this article actually tackles another model that has been produced by Google researchers called the Palm model. The Palm model, let's go ahead and take a look at the actual article title. So the article is Google's AI is something even stranger than conscious. Machine sentience is overrated. Okay, indeed, let's tackle this in a little bit more detail. All right, so step aside, Lambda, there is a new kid in town. That new kid is Palm. All right. Let's look at the difference between Palm and Lambda. So at least from a just pure architecture perspective, Lambda is smaller. Lambda is built and trained 137 billion parameters. Palm, on the other hand, is orders of magnitude larger. It, built, it is built on 500 and trains 540 billion parameters. So Palm is much more sophisticated, much more complex than Lambda is. Well, what does that mean in this context? Well, Palm is a weirdo. Palm can actually tell you why it comes up with the things that it comes up with when it responds. Let me give you an example. Here's the example they provide in the article. So standard prompting, so all these language models are built on prompts. They want you to give some examples so that they know how to respond to you. Sort of like tra training a small child. So in this case, we have a standard input prompt where you provide the model with this question answer question prompt and then you expect the model to provide a follow-up answer and that's the response you're looking for. In this case, the answer is simple. The answer is 11 to the first question. So the model responds simply with the answer is 27 to the next question, okay? Now let's look at what Palm does whenever you prompt it slightly differently. Whenever you prompt Palm with a slightly more informative reasoned response, reasoned answer, so in this case the answer is Roger started with five balls, two cans of, th of three tennis balls, each is six tennis balls, so five plus six equals 11, the answer is 11. It's telling you how it came to its conclusion. Well, when you do that, then the model actually emulates that reasoning. So the model then understands that you're providing a reason and it wants you to, it, it's asked that you're asking it to provide you with a reason. And so it does. It says, here is my reasoning. The cafeteria had 23 apples originally. They used 20 to make lunch. So they had 23 minus 20, which equals three. They bought six more apples. So they have three plus six equals nine. The answer is nine. It reasons. Palm is weird because it reasons. And guess what? Researchers don't actually know why it reasons like this. This was kind of a surprise discovery. Now, the researchers uh, that was interviewed uh, for this particular article goes on to explain that, look, this is not evidence that artificial intelligence is sentient because these models fundamentally are just asked to predict the next word. That's all. How they generate those predictions is dependent on how it was trained. Palm was trained in a way so that it actually can reason in ways that are surprising to these researchers. It is those surprise discoveries that create some allure and mysticism around artificial intelligence. But at the end of the day, we shouldn't sort of disregard what it's actually doing. It's responding to a prompt. So I actually got into a pretty deep, detailed conversation with my dad the other day about what it means to be artificially intelligent. And at the end of the day, agency is really important. And what's likely not the case with any of these models, Lambda or Palm, is that these models are not operating unless they're being asked to operate. That is, they require some command in order to do something. 
They don't just conjure up activity and generate responses when nothing is prompting them. That would be evidence of sentience in my mind. I think I agree. So what's interesting here is that these models are producing surprising results. But we need to be careful not to anthropomorphize those results. What we do need to do is better understand them so that when we release them into the public and products, we understand what the impacts could be. This article also highlights one of the main issues that I think is involved whenever we think about interacting with these very sophisticated language models. And that is that we as humans, particularly if we're not researchers or if we're not, you know, sort of uh, very, uh, if we don't understand what happens with artificial intelligence models under the covers and how they're trained, we might come to the conclusion, in fact, a large number of us might come to the conclusion that these things are actually sentient, right? That they actually have some agency. And that's a problem, ethically, as well as, you know, in terms of other sort of, uh, you know, applications, we could see how this could be a really big problem. So what I would recommend is let us not be too mysticized by these things being potentially alive because remember they still require compute and they still require a response to generate that compute that generates some output right instead what we should do is we should ask how are all of these very complex models with 540 billion parameters producing things that are surprising to us is it a window into some form of primitive brain processing I think the last article we just covered on autism may suggest that indeed there are some correlates that we can maybe learn from in these large language models for how our brain works. But lest we forget, let's not assume that these things are actually now aware. Artificial con consciousness and consciousness in and of itself, even the term understanding, are all very elusive and hard for us to define. We don't even really know what they are. So it would be really more impossible for us to say that something else is conscious when we've built it, we've created it with computers that have a limited sort of physics, and they require inputs in order to generate outputs. And that's really the only mechanism that drives their ability to respond. So with that in mind, really interesting research, lots more to come, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about this in the future. But please, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Comment. Let me know what you think about artificial consciousness and whether or not there's any merit to the argument that these models may be emulating something like consciousness. I don't know. Probably not, though. My understanding of these things is absolutely not. But I'd really be interested to engage in the conversation. So with that, here are the links. I will also provide these in the comments. Share this show, subscribe, talk about it, let people know I am bringing you information, understandable, really cool in the AI DSML space. Uh, I look forward to next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Bye, everybody.